Alex Antic is a senator for the Liberal Party in the federal parliament, representing the whole state of South Australia. I catch up with Senator Antic regularly, and today we're talking about the involvement of people of religious faith in politics and all the heat surrounding the Prime Minister and his faith, but then this business of Christians engaging in politics in South Australia and his role in encouraging them to do so. Senator Antic, uh, there's been a lot of commentary in your home state of South Australia, but in politics generally about Christians and people of strong religious faith being involved in politics. But working backwards a bit here, we've got a prime minister who is said to be of a Pentecostal faith. What's your working understanding of what that means? Uh, You know, who... The Prime Minister's got um, a faith that, uh, not Anglican, not Lutheran, not uh, Catholic, what is that? Well, I mean, that is a, uh, a separate branch of Christianity, I suppose, and it's a sort of an American style of Pentecostalism, um, which, you know, have different services, of course, and uh, uh, a different stream of Christianity, a bit like, uh, um, you know, Orthodox, Catholic, or Anglican, or whatever it might be. And it is an interesting point, because the Prime Minister, as you know, made it um, reasonably clear, I think, prior to the last election, that you know, he was a person that uh, attended Pentecostal, a Pentecostal church, Hillsong, I think it was, in uh, uh, in Sydney, um, which of course sparked an inevitable um, discussion, and, and I think a healthy discussion about the position of the church and politics, um, and it's one that's been chewed over uh, many times, of course, in the past, but it's one that I think, um, in my view, is often weaponised by the left. I think frankly, there is almost nothing to see here when it comes to this issue about separation of church and state. I mean, we live in a pluralistic, um, liberal uh, democracy, which is inclusive. And that means that we want people to participate in democracy from all walks of life, you know, whether they hold a particular occupation or a particular religious belief um, or come from a particular country. That's the purpose of what we do. It's to try to, uh, to try to get a a good result, um, and certainly my party, the Liberal Party, uh, I believe, uh, although uh, we are a Christian secular country and you know the Liberal Party doesn't profess any one particular faith, but it's a party based in Judeo-Christian principles. Um, and the founding father of the party, Robert Menzies, was very clear about that. Uh, in fact, there's a famous speech of his in 1960 where um, he spoke at the opening of the uh, Memorial Bible House in Canberra where he said words to the effect of, if I was an agnostic or an atheist, which which I'm not, and he describes uh, in, in his words that those as unhappy people, um, he would still take a Bible with him um, if he was stranded on a desert island because the learnings and the teachings that come from the text are so critical and have been so critical to the foundation of our country. So I think that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about principles in many respects rather than dogma. Yeah, and we'll come back to that Menzies topic in a short while, but um, coming the Prime Minister side of it, and I apologise, we sort of focus on the, the identity of you know the Prime Minister sometimes as yeah. the driving force in these debates, but has the debate shifted from when Kevin Rudd took that sort of unprecedented approach of doing press conferences outside of church on a Sunday morning? <laughs> there wasn't the same level of alarmism, I thought, about his faith uh, as an Anglican, I think, than there was about this current Prime Minister's faith. Well, I'm, I'm probably going to show a little bit of my own bias here, and you would expect that from a Liberal senator. But look, I think you're quite right. Um, and I think we see that across the board when it comes to the reporting of things this Prime Minister has done. Um, in my view, um, he was set upon in a most extraordinary manner um, around the time of the bushfires um, a year or two ago. Um, the same can be said with a number of different instances. I, I think, personally, that there is an enormous double standard when it comes to the mainstream media in this country. And, and I think there is no doubt that um, a Labor Prime Minister who, you know, who takes that one view in respect of um, Christianity gets a very different run to a Conservative. And basically, I think there is a war on conservatism. OK, uh, and we've talked about that previously as well. <laughs> and um, you, you've said that it's important uh, in a previous interview too that um, people, whatever their view is, but certainly people of strong faith or conviction should get involved in, in grassroots politics. And that's something clearly you've been encouraging people to do in South Australia because there was an article in Daily, uh, a online publication in South Australia at the end of last week indicating that um, you'd had some meetings at um, a church in the southern suburbs and some things were said there that stirred some controversy. What, what's the go there? What have you been trying to achieve to encourage people of faith to get involved in the Liberal Party? Well, I think, um, as I said earlier in the week, um, this actually comes back to, um, in my view, some of the stirrings that have been aroused in people 
um, as a result of the position of state parliaments all across the country. And that applies here in South Australia. And we only have to look to the events of two days ago with the passing of um, the state-sanctioned uh, suicide, state-assisted suicide bill, um, to, to know that things have changed in Parliament. And um, in the terms of a social policy agenda, things have really shifted. And people are worried. Um, I said um, earlier in the week that I was um, dis- discouraged and disappointed to learn that after 65 or 63, depending on the numbers, depending on the area, percent of people in SA outwardly rejected the late-term abortion bill, the Parliament still delivered it. And that, in my mind, raised um, a lot of frustration in people um, because their voices were not heard. Now, that's an overwhelming majority. People have been asking me ever since, what do we do? We wrote, we sent letters, we marched, we rang officers of parliamentarians, and many didn't listen. My view has always been, if you're fair dinkum about your values and you're fair dinkum about your views then you need to be involved in the machinery of politics. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why, and, and, and I don't want this to be an advertorial, but it, it, it's an advertorial for activism in politics. Um, in political parties, particularly the parties of government, uh, there is an opportunity for people who have a view to join, to go to branch meetings, to select the candidates that go to uh, parliament, or, on, or put up by the parties to go to parliament, to get involved in policy discussion and to shape the values base of the party. Now, that's a mechanism that I think many people weren't aware of prior to um, recent times. I mean, obviously there are a lot of people that are involved in politics, but many didn't understand that this opportunity existed. Uh, and so I have I have been encouraging people to do that. Obviously, I would only ever encourage people to join my party, the Liberal Party. But, um, you know, it's, it's an op- opportunity that's there. And the rates of people and participation in politics over the last 30 years has dropped dramatically. There used to be something like and I'll get these numbers a bit wrong, but approximately 30,000 people involved in the major parties or members thereof. It's now about 5,000. And that means that the decision-making is going into the hands of very few. And, and I think it's time that people, of whatever their views are, it doesn't matter whether they're Christian or they're left-wing or they're right-wing, whatever it is, um, that they get back involved. You know, we need, we need people to be involved in the decision-making process all the way through. Now, um, that's a really interesting point because, as you say, there's reduced numbers within, I guess, branches and uh, the, those that decide who are candidates and things like that. Can you give us a, a working understanding of branch stacking? You know, some people will claim that people are stacking in Victoria, for instance. There was a lot of yeah. angst around this topic and people of faith, uh, not just Christian faith, I think Mormons and others were coming into the party. Where does Where is the line between uh, encouraging people to join and the, the political understanding of branch stacking? It's a great question. Look, and I think um, one of the difficulties, of course, is that there isn't really a definition, a statutory or a legal definition of that term. Um, but colloquially and anecdotally, it's referred to a pro- it refers to a process which relates to large numbers of people going into a branch. Um, so that is, uh, a particular candidate might have their eye on a particular branch. So what do they do? They go and get 100 friends to sign up they hold them off to the right time, and they dump them into a branch. Now, that's sort of what's often... I mean, there are many different versions of that, but that's what we're, you know, we're sort of usually um, led to believe is the term. That is a very different proposition to people across a state and a country deciding they want to participate in politics. Um, people have their own free will, um, with their own money, uh, on their own accord, um, signing up, getting involved, and having their voice heard. Uh, I and mean, that's actually the very definition of democracy. So I think there is, a, there is a distinction here. The term's often bandied around, I think, you know, sometimes um, a little bit loosely. As I said, there really isn't, a, you know, a statutory or legal definition of the term, but in broad terms, it's manipulation rather than a movement. Yeah, and this is interesting. When you look at the Labor Party in Victoria, for instance, there was an intervention by the federal body of the Labor Party to say, well, we will control or manage pre-selections and decisions about who are candidates because they were concerned about stacking or whatever you want to call it in that party. Wouldn't that rankle people if they've piled into a political party uh, because of their strong convictions and then a federal party says, well, no, we're going to make decisions about candidates anyway? Yeah, well, I mean, the machinations of the Labor Party, of course, are for the Labor Party, but, of course, it's a top-down uh, organisation, whereas the Liberal Party is a member-driven, grassroots sort of organisation. Um, I might say that um, the leadership of uh, the Liberal Party has expressed no concerns about <clears throat> any of this. And, in fact, uh, Simon Birmingham was on radio earlier in the week and uh, welcomed people as long as they shared our values. And I would be in screaming agreement with that, as did the Premier, who thought it was a great idea. So 
um, we have to encourage membership. Um, we have to be in a position to do that. And I think, you know, any efforts uh, for political parties to, to step on that really flies in the face of what politics is meant to be. And look, you know, the Labor Party may well take that view, um, but, you know, you would you'd be very hopeful, of course, that um, people welcome new members because one of the things we struggle with um, at political level is, in many respects, um, an ageing membership base. A lot of work goes into uh, running campaigns, putting up core flutes, you know, posters on po- uh, pos- letterboxing, walking the streets, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't want a, you don't want an eighty year old climbing up a stobie pole. Yeah, you don't, and you'd be surprised how often it happens, wouldn't we? I mean, people probably would. I mean, there'd be many eighty year olds out there that would have climbed a lot of poles, and it's very dangerous. So, you know, I think parties should be across the board. They should be encouraging new members, regardless of yep. religion, belief. What, what you know, as long as they're in, as long as people are in uh, step with the fair principles of the party, I think. I can't see a reason why politics should be pushing people away. And that's uh, just to be clear on your call, uh, what you're encouraging people of faith to do. uh, If they want to join the Labor Party, they could as well. It's a a matter for people. I mean, I I, obviously I'm a faithful and proud servant of the Liberal Party. I I believe it's the most effective um, party to reflect to their Christian values of, of all sorts. But I mean, people just there are some people that just couldn't countenance that. I can't believe it, but that that is true. Uh, and it's important their voice is somewhere. We're seeing what I would say is arguably the most serious degeneration of Judeo-Christian values we've seen in a long period of time. Um, Conversion therapy bills, late-term abortion bills, euthanasia bills, they're all coming at once. Conservatives in particular have been very quiet. We we are people, I think, who cross the board take the view that it's going to be all right. The institutions have always served us well and they won't let us down. I'm not sure that's the case anymore. I think people have got to get involved. Now, you mentioned some of those um, topics before, like euthanasia and abortion. You just mentioned a whole bunch again. Why is it that people of faith, Christian people, for instance, are so energised around those topics and not, say, housing or asylum seekers or the budget and getting it back in the black? What is it that draws people of faith to those particular topics in politics? Well, I think those topics speak directly into you know the teachings and the values that... that, that Christians, social conservatives, cultural conservatives hold dear, and you know they are, I think, sometimes a little bit more digestible as well. Everybody can identify with, um, you know, pregnancy and uh, you know having a sick parent and the decisions, awful decisions that arise as a result of that. Um, and it's also, you know, particularly for people like me that are a bit balance sheet illiterate, I have to say, uh, that the fiscal side of it can be a bit more confronting, a bit more difficult, a bit more subtle sometimes too, I think. Um, but you're quite right. It, uh, there are issues that. We need people's input in politics from the beginning. You know, we we need people of all sorts. We're not talking just about members. I mean, one of the issues with people being involved in politics is the interest that it grows in them. And, you you know, we don't know where the next rung of parliamentarians is going to come from, but they're out there somewhere in the community, and we want to make sure that we're attracting the best and brightest. Um, We don't want politics to be a closed shop. Increasingly, I think it has become a closed shop. Uh, Bob Hawke spoke about this before his, his death, about his dismay at the way the Labor Party um, had sort of developed almost into a machine of trade unionists and trade union lawyers coming into ministers' offices, um, going into Parliament themselves and then going off and becoming lobbyists. But I think increasingly that's a a trend across politics per se. So we we need people's interest. Uh, I think it's that, and also that Conservatives are often doing other things, running businesses, taking kids to school, doing all the things. I mean, sure, the left are doing those as well, but the left of politics seems to fight. They seem to get the bit between their teeth and go, I think at the time Conservatives took up that challenge as well. Now, you mentioned, this is the last question here about, uh, you mentioned Menzies earlier. Vicky Chapman from the Liberal Party, she's tweeted a quote from Robert Menzies. She seems to be angling that the Liberal Party is a, is a broader church for people of all sorts of persuasions, and she's trying to invoke Menzies as being focused on that uh, rather than hearkening to any of his Christian heritage. Is Vicky Chapman on the right track there? Well, I mean, I think... Um, the Liberal Party is a centre-right conservative party. Um, Robert Menzies was a Christian, um, and he was a person that I think, um, from what I understand of his work and his speeches and his writing and his history, they didn't try to impose that on anyone, and that's what we're saying. I mean, that's not no one's trying to impose a particular religious ethos on anyone. Um, but he was a person that believed in individual freedom, uh, freedom of speech, um, families, anti-communist behaviour, all this sort of stuff. Um, And there's no doubt. I mean, there are plenty, plenty of speeches in which Menzies refers to the importance of those values uh, in politics. Um, There there are many, many of them. 
so I, look, I, I don't. Uh, I mean, I don't really understand that. I think it's very easy to, um, you know, pick out statements where Menzies used the word progressive and claim that to be his overriding ethos. But the fact remains, Menzies was a Christian. He was a person that took great pride in Judeo-Christian principles, um, and that is the. I mean, the, the Liberal Party was designed for the quiet Australians, as it's now known, but the forgotten people as they were known in 1940. Um, that that is Middle Australia. That is people that love their families, just want to work, get on with life. Um, and and I think that fits very, very squarely within the confines of Judeo-Christian values. Yep, selective quotes can be uh, difficult when you're not looking at the broader work of an individual and selective quotes can be as dangerous as that great quote from Abraham Lincoln, don't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> on, on that very, note, very. you've been generous with your time, Senator Antic. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Ricky. Always Jeez. good. Uh, and on a serious note to finish, uh, Senator Antic refers to the assisted suicide. Uh, it's called various things, uh, euthanasia, voluntary assisted dying. If you are someone who is in crisis and needing help or wanting to talk about that situation with someone, please contact Lifeline on 131114.